But thank you for coming to the Osterville Village Library this afternoon, this gorgeous November Saturday. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Anthony Samarco, who they say every time he comes is a great friend of the Osterville Village Library and is extremely generous with his time um, for us and our patrons. Today, he's going to be talking about his new book, Inferno, the Great Boston Fire of 1872. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and those of you on Zoom. When I wrote the 125th anniversary book of the Great Boston Fire, I thought to myself it was a fun endeavor. And of course, 25 years later, having read so much more and collected so much more ephemera and paper goods that discuss the fire, I really wanted to do a book for the 150th. And seeing here the cover which is actually a Courier and Ives print, a detail of it, that actually shows the fire destroying downtown Boston, which was 65 acres, where Jordan's and Filene's was once located all the way to the waterfront. We see the dome of the Massachusetts State House and, of course, many of the spires of the Boston churches. But this was a devastating fire. And in today's aspect, we'd realize in some ways that the entire downtown district was affected, whether it was destroyed outright or even just basically caused tremendous harm. We realized it was something that was quite different. But in a lot of ways, and I'm going to, it's not moving. Okay, there we go. Very good. I had to click on that. So in a lot of ways, the area of downtown Boston that we know of as the shopping district is an area in some ways that was once residential. And seen here in a painting, this is from 1825, the old South End, as it was called, versus the North End on the other side of State Street, would be something that was considered the epitome of urbane living in the early 19th century. Charles Bullfinch had introduced neoclassicism in the 1790s with the design of the Tontine Crescent on Franklin Place. In fact, Samuel Adams Drake, author of Old Landmarks and Historic Personages of Boston, said, quote, Summer Street was, beyond dispute, the most beautiful avenue in Boston. Shaded by a grove in a light, softened by the leafy screen and over the shadows of the big elms lying across the pavement, unquote. And the neighborhood also had numerous places of worship. The First Church of Boston, Trinity Church, New Old South Church, the Federal Street Church, and the church, later the Cathedral of the Holy Cross, and the Church of, uh, of the Savior, which were all within a few blocks of one another, and a testimony to the aspects of a neighborhood. During that period, and this is a photograph from the 1860s, that church that we saw in the center, designed by Bullfinch and called the Octagonal Church, shows on the side the residential quality of the neighborhood around Summer Street. And in this photograph, is evident by the early 1860s with a corner of the portico of the octagonal church on the right and row houses on the left along Bedford Street leading to Chauncey Street. And the wide expanse of the open square in the foreground, paved in cobblestones, created an impressive approach to the church and has long been known as Church Green. But in the mid-19th century, Boston was undergoing major changes through the topographical infill of the South End, the present South End, on either side of the neck of Boston, the massive infilling of the Back Bay marshes, as well as the increase in population by matriculation and immigration. And following the Civil War, Boston would see its population increase to 250,000 people by 1870, of which one half was either immigrants or the children of immigrants. And the city was embracing change, ethnic as well as religious, and was a far cry for the homogeneous town settled by the Puritans from England in 1630. By 1872, much of the former residential neighborhood, known as the South End, had given way to commerce. Summer, Bedford, Kingston, Arch, Franklin, and Federal Streets, and others, had once been the pride of the Athens of America, but by the 1860s, most of its residents had moved to the newly filled South End, the Back Bay, and the suburbs. And the area was rebuilt with impressive five-story commercial blocks that not only changed the face of Boston, but were architecturally impressive with their, quote, their splendid fronts, unquote, that became the pride of Victorian Boston, its merchants, and the Bostonians who now thronged to the area. 
And seen here, since the mid 18th century, Summer Street had been one of the more fashionable residential areas in Boston. This duplex red brick Greek Revival row house was designed by Asher Benjamin, a Richard Tucker and James Page. It had ionic columns flanking the two entrances, swell bay facades, fanciful carved window lintels, roof cresting, and impressive cast iron balconies and fencing with superb urns. It faced Church Green and was indicative of the well-designed houses built in the 1830s. And as the neighborhood changed and became less desirable as a place of residence, this duplex house was demolished in 1865. But Boston wasn't just seeing the residential houses demolished. They were now seeing these enormous four, five, even six-story commercial buildings being built. And this is Franklin Street in Boston, which was laid out in the 1790s by noted architect Charles Bullfinch and included row houses on either side of the elliptical curve. Known as the Tontine Crescent, this was an upscale neighborhood in the first half of the 19th century, but by the 1850s, the city was expanding commercially. The row houses were demolished, but the gentle elliptical arc of Bullfinch's Tontine Crescent was maintained with the rebuilding of new commercial blocks in 1859. And looking towards Federal Street with Arch Street on the right, the four and five story buildings commanded the streetscape and were the pride and joy of the city. In the center distance can be seen the cathedral building built on the original site of the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. And the cathedral building, which was designed by Joseph Billings, was designed and built on the site of the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. In this instance, this was something that was a major feature as Boston changed topographically, demographically, and religiously. And in that instance, this was something that proved too small for the city's increasing Catholic population and was enlarged in 1825. The last mass was set in 1860 and the church was demolished in 1862. Patrick Donahue bought the land and had the impressive cathedral built, building built, where the Boston pilot was printed. And it was also the location of the Emigrant Savings Bank and other stores. But so too wasn't the BB block built an impressive five-story commercial block with a mansard roof that was built on Devonshire and Otis Streets at Winthrop Square. Built in 1861, the block was named for owner James Madison Beebe, a successful dry goods merchant, and Beebe was credited with being one of the first men, if not the first, in his line of business to introduce the system of cash payments. His motto was, quote, quick money and small profits, unquote. And he was known to sell at a 5% advance when other merchants were receiving an advance of 10 to 15%. The store carried on an enormous trade in dry goods in all parts of the country and was especially strong in the Great Pan Panic of 1857. And at that time, Beebe was rated as the largest jobber of dry goods in New England and second in the country only to Alexander Stewart of New York. Well, in this instance, in the fall of 1872, Boston was in the throes of an equine influenza that affected horses, most of whom began to show symptoms such as a cough and general sluggishness. The disease was said to have emanated from Canada, and within weeks, the symptoms had become prevalent in major cities. Horses showed a common symptom, including discharge from the nostril and eyes, a rasping cough, general exhaustion, and the inability to work. And these symptoms and the images of sick horses were so ubiquitous that they became the subject of satire, as in the etching of an ill horse called a chivalrous patient, which appeared in Harper's Weekly. However, this was a serious situation, as the impact on Boston by the affected horses was devastating, especially as horses were vital in not just pulling carriages and carts, but also the delivery of goods, foods, and supplies. And the result was that manpower was necessary, and it extended to the transportation of fire engines if needed at a fire. And with most of the horses in the city suffering with the equine flu, the Detroit Free Press said on October 26th of 1872 that horses worsened with a, quote, dry and hacking cough, 
moving with reluctance and general dullness, nasal membranes at first pale, watery discharge from one or both nostrils, ears and legs cold, unquote. And of course, these horses were a major part of the economy. And of course, they provided the income for many small families. This is a print that shows people on the brink of ruin when their horse itself basically just laid on its side. It was said that over 15% of the horses in Boston died from this equine flu. But it was also the fact that we realized that transportation was impacted. We're all too young to remember horse-drawn omnibuses and horse-drawn streetcars, but this was something that was quite impressive. And this epizoic in the fall of 1872 affected the horses of Boston. It was devastating as horses were important in not just pulling carts and push carts, but also the streetcars that crisscrossed the city of Boston. And seen here is streetcar 86 that connects Boston via the South End to Roxbury, terminating at the Norfolk House on Roxbury Meeting House Hill. And with most of the horses in Boston suffering from the equine flu, conductors and passengers are depicted in this etching pulling a streetcar along its tracks during the epizoic. Even Edward Savage, chief of police in Boston, said, the, horses, the horse disease commenced in Boston, making it necessary to propel fire engines, horse cars, and other vehicles through the street with human muscle. And that satire would actually show this chivalrous patient, which appeared in Harper's Weekly, and depicts a horse suffering from the epizoic with his hooves in a warm pail of water, a blanket round his shoulders, and a steaming hot toddy with medicine behind him. But it was serious business, because in some instances, Boston was a metropolis. It was the Athens of America. And with a quarter of a million people, this photograph, which was taken in 1863, was called Boston, as the eagle and the wild goose sees it. It was a detail of a photograph taken by James Wallace Black in 1860 from Samuel King's hot air balloon, which was called the Queen of the Air. In 1863, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote in the Atlantic Monthly, Boston, as the eagle and white goose sees it, is a very different object from the same place, as the solid citizen looks up at its eaves and chimneys. The Old South and Trinity Church are two landmarks not to be mistaken, and Washington Street slants across the picture as a narrow cleft, lower left-hand side. Milk Street winds as if an old cow path which gave its name and had been followed by the builders of its commercial palaces. Well, Boston was building new buildings. And this not only was a major structure completed in 1871, but it was actually a place where there was a hoop skirt factory. And this was the building where the fire commenced. Lehman Kluse, who had built this, was a major impact in Boston's economy. He was a German immigrant, but had done quite well since his arrival in 1848. Well, the fire began in the Cluse building on Summer Street, which was engulfed in flames within minutes. The fury of the fire rose to the wood frame mansard roof that burnt out of reach of fire hoses and continued unabated until the flames inevitably spread from one mansard roof to the next. And the heat from the burning buildings, the geysers of sparks and embers, became infernal, and its intensity caused the granite facades to implode, falling to the street. It was said that, quote, blocks of granite weighing tons were split as if by powder and hurled across wide streets, unquote. And the fire spread, and Russell Conwell, a man who wrote a book on the fire, in a falling building on Franklin Street, there were seen through the flashes of fire the forms of men attempting to leap from the windows, but they never reached the pavement. Their cries were heard above the crashing timbers, and all the noise of explosions awakening shrilly echoes in the ears of those who heard which will never cease to call. At the time of the fire, the face of the granite was peeled off like a chestnut in a toaster meaning over the open fire. And great granite chips tumbled to the ground as if an invisible hand with a mallet and steel was at work, bent on defacing the smooth surfaces and sharp lines with all the haste possible. Facades of the commercial blocks fell with a sudden roar, sending up showers of sparks and cinders, 
and as well as a lurid black smoke that enveloped the streets. However, it was not just commercial blocks that were aflame, even churches were engulfed by the fire. Well, John Damrell, seen here in a lithograph by Edward Howe, is seen with his initials on his belt buckle, holding his leather helmet with its chief badge and his brass speaking trumpet under his arm. Damrell was elected to the position of chief engineer of the Boston Fire Department in 1866. He warned city officials about the danger of fire in the business district, and he is concerned with the water supply shortage of fire hydrants, lack of fire equipment, and the density of tall buildings with wooden mansard roofs in the district. And recognizing the need for long-term improvements in construction practices, he also advocated for the establishment of a building department and building inspection service with the authority to enforce fire and building codes. Well, in that instance, Many people would see this as a great example. This was a career in ice print, and it says the American fireman. Well, we see him pulling a fire engine, but the whole aspect was it would have been pulled by a horse at this time. This is a good example of what would have happened during the fire. The epizoic laid low all horses, including those owned by the fire department. And these men would pull two-ton engines anywhere from 10 to 12 blocks to arrive at the fire. And seen here, by the time they arrived, because they were winded, and the fact that the fire plugs, what we would know of as hydrants today, were actually low on water. These were buildings that were now four, five, six stories in height, but the plugs were sufficient for three-story residential buildings. So they could never reach the fire, which went from one wood-framed mansard roof to the next. And seen here, the cathedral building, built at a cost of $300,000 in 1870, which was not insured, was actually destroyed within minutes because of its fluids and printing press, as well as all of its flammable materials. And seen here, Into the Jaws of Death, which was done in Harper's Weekly, a major newspaper in the United States in the mid-19th century, these men who were called out, not just from the Boston Fire Department, but eventually from almost every surrounding city and town. This was something that was devastating, and there was no aspect to actually being able to actually stop the fire. Some paintings were done after the scene, but this gives a good impression, a view of the Boston Fire, a view of Boston from across the harbor in East Boston, and this was done by F. William Shaw in 1876. And John Damrell, the city's fire engineer, described the fire, quote, the conflict raged for 15 hours with an unrelenting fury, and it was the most terrific engagement by the fire department, but superiority over the fire fiend even recorded, ever recorded in the annals of the city. You began to realize it wasn't just something that was seen from across the area in East Boston, it was seen for miles in every direction. Even Courier and Ives had done this print. It's one of my favorites. It hangs in my study. And it shows the fire of November 9th and November 10th. And in the foreground, we not only see the fire, but in the water, we see excursion boats, rowboats, and sailboats. People would pay a quarter to actually get onto these boats and be actually taken as close as they could to the fire. It wasn't just the fact that the buildings were burning, but the area where the fire concentrated were the coal wharves. Now, we're all too young to remember coal fire places and coal furnaces, but coal was a big part of the heating aspect of 19th century Boston, and it burnt for days on end. Now, I call it, in some ways, flown away as the eagle towards heaven. The fire burnt throughout the night, creating a macabre scene that could only be likened to that of Dante Alighieri's Inferno. Overworked firemen, frantic merchants, and curious onlookers made the scene one of utter chaos. The fire was so intense that men could see the light, flaming against the midnight sky, growing wider, broader, and higher. It's flame so high that it becomes a beacon light to mariners 300 miles away so bright that it gilds not only the dome of the Massachusetts State House and surrounds spires, but lights up the blue hills of Milton. 
The epicenter of the conflagration was engulfed in flames. Frothingham, another well-known writer of the fire, said that, quote, blocks of granite weighing tons was split as if by powder and hurled across wide streets, and planks went flying through the air as if they were feathers, unquote. People screaming, firemen yelling orders, with no one paying any heed, and the crash of falling blocks of granite, the hum of engines, the roar of the seething flames, the hiss of steam, and immense volumes of water were poured in upon the burning mass, and the shouting of the firemen made up a babble of horrid sounds. It was like pandemonium. And seen here... By the period of midnight, as I mentioned, every city and town around the city of Boston began to send not only firemen, but fire engines. And seen here, this was a supplement to Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, and it shows an etching by John Henderson of the arrival of a special train from Worcester, conveying the Worcester Fire Department with steam fire engines to the scene of the disaster. And the frantic and highly charged scene as the fire engine is removed from a flatbed of the train can be sensed as it was eased onto a ramp and then pulled by hand to the fire as hundreds watched on the sidelines. In some ways, the entire area, as you can see at the very top from Washington Street and on the left-hand side down, of course, Summer and Bedford Street to the waterfront would actually include the area on the right of Milk and Water Street, and again through Pearl Street to the waterfront. 65 acres of land, an area that not only had the cotton and wool brokerage, shoe and leather, as well as financial interests of the city. Seen here, this is a scene from the roof of the C.F. Hovey Company on Summer Street. And this photograph looks across to what had once been Franklin and Milk Streets after the Great Boston Fire of 1872 photographed by Arthur Partridge and one of the many photographers who descended upon the burnt district to, to record the devastation in stereo views. Russell Conwell, again, that writer of the very well-known book on the history of the fire, said, quote, the vista from the vicinity of Summer Street was grandiose and disheartening. Flames flickered up from time to time from the mass of broken, seared, disjointed masonry, played around the cracked and dismantled bases of the great carved iron pillars and sometimes burst out vehemently from the intercies of the debris and great columns of smoke rose majestically into the clean air and then formed into party colored clouds which cast dull shadows over the scene. A little, at a little distance in the ruin field, the smoke almost shut off the view and the fragmentary wall of an ordinary business block or the tottering sections of some huge furnace, lately a row of houses, took on fantastic forms. And one of the people that actually depicted it, not in a photograph, but in a painting, was John Enneking. And this was called The Ruins of Boston. It's a striking scene in its graphic realism of the devastating fire. It was almost as if a, quote, a thick blood red cloud was hovering over the city, unquote, as the Boston Globe article from November 11th of 1872 said, filling the hearts of all with an ominous and indefinable mixture of terror and sadness. Lucius Beebe said, Sunday morning dawned on a tremendous yellow pillar of smoke, which rolled like a symbol of doom slowly over the harbor. And on the left is the spire of the Park Street Church with the dome of the State House. The devastation was just incredible. And this is, of course, Washington Street. And you can see the old South Meeting House in the distance at the corner of Milk Street. This area would see these facades survive, but nothing behind them. And you can see Washington Street littered with boulders of granite that weighed anywhere from five to 10 tons. The devastation was incredible, and they began to call it the Burnt District. And John Demrell, the city's fire engineer, was an integral witness to the destruction of the area by fire and described its progress. Quote, the conflict raged for 15 hours with an unrelenting fury and was, quote, the most terrific engagement by the fire department for superiority over the fire feed ever recorded in the annals of the city, unquote. 
One can only imagine the confusion and anxiety of the firemen as fire chiefs shouted orders from their fire trumpets to men who could hardly hear above the roar of the fire and shouting spectators. Even if they could hear, the scene was one of such utter chaos that it was only increased with time. A lack of water power from inadequate sources and the fact that water could only be reached at the third story of the five-story buildings daunted the efforts of the firemen who watched and were unable to do anything to check the fire spread. In addition, people were hindered, hindering the emphasis of the firefighters, and something had to be done. Russell Cromwell said, cordons of soldiery with fixed bayonets kept off the pressing crowd, or capturing a host of citizens between two lines, reaching from curb to curb, marching them to side streets, and gently expelled them from the vicinity of the crumbling and overhanging ruins. The roll of the drum was heard on every side, and the sonorous fall in echoed, and those turbulently inclined among such of the spectators as has not directly felt the sting of loss by the conflagration were speedily subdued by the military men, who seemed to bear a full sense of their importance. I'm seen here with the Claflin Guards. This was the Newton Company C, 1st Regiment, Massachusetts Mil Militia. They're drawn up in formation on Kilby Street, and Mayor William Gaston had requested, quote, as Sunday drew to a smoking and hysterical close, that exhausted as they were, the police would not be sufficient to maintain order throughout the city. Six battalions of the state militia were mobilized, and although martial law was never declared, so that these had no actual authority, the crowds naturally imagined that they had, and their presence was respected accordingly. And seen in the foreground, in the center is Captain William Barnes Sears, on the left is First Lieutenant F. Barnes, and on the right, Second Lieutenant W. Sears, in front of the militia drawn up in formation. Most people going into the burnt district had to have a pass. And this was a pass that was is issued in such a way by, of course, people in Boston for the first brigade of 1866. And as you can see, pass the bearer within the lines enclosed to the burnt district. It wasn't just for their safety, it was also the fact that there were safes, some of which were actually intact, that might have hundreds of thousands of dollars. But seen here, the members of Sheridan's Rifle Guard, and these were soldiers under Major General Philip Sheridan of Civil War fame, were quartered in the Old South Meeting House, which was still an active place of worship at the time of the fire. A new church was to be built at Copley Square in 1876. And here, soldiers posed for a photograph, some leaning on the high box pews, others standing on them, as they were on break from their guard duty. And for weeks following the fire, the burnt district was encircled by a double line of soldiers with bayonets. And the box pews, which had once served as seats for worshippers, now served as hard beds for the soldiers. Seen here in front of what was to be remaining of the Boston Post Office and Sub-Treasury, members of the Boston Police Department actually posed for their photograph. In some ways, these were men who had worked for two days straight and they would actually be assisted by the various um, troops that were coming into the Boston. But the area of Milk and Federal Street, as we can see here, I don't know how they actually could tell the streets, were the ruins of Wright and Potter, the state printer. And the company was owned by Albert Wright and Robert Potter. And though the building was destroyed, the tall brick chimney marks the spot of the business, which has a sign stating that they have relocated to 34 School Street. Members of the Claflin Guard are seen on the right with rifles to protect the burnt district. And of course here, Colonel Russell Conwell in his book, The History of the Great Boston Fire in Boston, describes the burnt district, quote, in the stead of noble buildings of granite and marble and brick were huge, giant walls, torn and ragged, and broken columns of stone and iron. And the lines of the streets were entirely obliterated, and the ways were so blocked by great boulders of granite and heaps of debris, in some places from three to ten feet deep, 
that those who had been the most familiar with the section before the fire were utterly unable to find their way and groped about or clambered over the obstructing rock, brick, iron, and still hot to be rubbish, dazed and bewildered, unquote. And these men posed some of the ruins for the photographer. We saw that the area of what is today Post Office Square would have canvas tents and temporary wood sheds with corrugated metal roofs erected on the cleared area for those working in the burnt district to rest or have refreshments. And here in the shadow of the spire of the old South Media House on Milk Street on the right, men are gathered around a liberty pole as they began the arduous job of rolling miles of canvas fire hoses and clearing away the debris, which was dumped into Boston Harbor and along what became Atlantic Avenue. And here in a close-up of a photograph that I acquired on eBay, we see not just firemen, but the men actually setting up many of these places of relief for the merchants and men who actually dug around to save whatever they could of their businesses. Well, the devastation was just incredible. In this photograph, we see Trinity Church. Now, though Trinity today is at Copley Square, it was actually at the corner of what is today Summer and Holly Streets. The building was a magnificent granite structure, as you can see, Gothic revival in design. And though the building wall stood, everything inside was destroyed. Well, this was a place where the Reverend Phillips Brooks had been rector from Trinity Church since 1869. And he said that the desolation of the fire is bewildering. Old Trinity seemed safe all night. But towards morning, the fire swept into her, and there was no chance. She went at four in the morning. I saw her well afire, inside and out, carried off some books and robes, and left her. She went majestically, and her great tower stands now as solid as ever, a most picturesque and stately ruin. She died in dignity. I do not know how much I liked the gloom, gloomy old thing until I saw her windows bursting, and the flame running along her high old pews. Well, it wasn't just the church that were destroyed, but even the crypt below. If you've ever been at Filene's basement, you have to realize that that was once a place of burial. And seen here, commenting on the ruins of Trinity Church, Edward Monroe Bacon said, its broken tower and partly crumbled walls presenting the most picturesque ruin of all that is costly confrogation. The interior of Trinity Church has been destroyed of everything except the stone walls, including the floor, exposing the family tombs in the crypt, though the iron doors remained in place. Within just a few days after the fire, the city of Boston notified families to remove the remains from crypts and rebury them in a cemetery. Mount Auburn, Forest Hills, Mount Hope, even Cedar Grove and Dorchester would actually see families reinterring the dead. But seen here, Milk Street, which extends from Washington Street to Atlantic Avenue, lay in ruins from the rear of the Old South Meeting House to Oliver Street at Liberty Square. Soldiers stand among granite blocks of the ruins of a building, with many men gathered in the street on the right. It was said that, quote, every bit of vantage ground from the dread corner near which the fatal fire began to the waterside and along state was crowded with the motley groups of spectators, each asking a hundred questions as is in as many breaths, unquote. And of course here, two merchants, one in a bowler and the other in a top hat, a policeman and a man sitting on a board, a photographed amongst the debris and the ruins of buildings on Arch Street. The Tower of Trinity Church is seen in the distance, and is enveloped in a haze, creating an almost ethereal scene to the burnt district. And it was said, approaching the burnt district, one might readily have fancied himself in a recently captured and bombarded town. Well, in some ways, it was said that ladies, of course, escorted by gentlemen, ventured into the midst of the furnace. They had been clamoring all day over the ruins of their husbands' and fathers' warehouses, and listening with a sort of pride to their escorts describing the magnitude of the losses. And in that instance, many people began to realize that the ruins were said to be picturesque and fascinating. 
Well, the devastation of the burnt district was incomprehensible. Streets were covered in granite blocks and mounds of bricks from which iron pillars that had once supported the five-story commercial blocks lay bent and twisted. And the area east of Washington Street was one large debris field that attracted the attention of Bostonians. It was said that on Monday, November 11th of 1872, there were pictures of awful desolation and ruin in one great section. And immediately about and around, in marked contrast, pictures of a holiday or gala day kind, where strangers thronged unceasingly from morning till night, looking contented, interested, and happy, watching the cavalry as they cantered by, examining the wares of the itinerant peddlers on the Tremont Mall, studying the smoky sky through the big telescope, or trying the lung testers, carrying themselves for all the world as if it were a festival they had journeyed hither to see, rather than the destruction of a great section of a great city by fire. Well, in that instance, some of these pictures were just incredible. They were staged. Dozens of photograph uh, takers would come, and they would actually ask people to just clamber among the ruins. And in this instance, they're really wonderful details of what these various buildings must have looked like in the days and weeks after the fire. Just sitting on ruins, along with all sorts of metal columns and metal pieces in the foreground. And even here, the H&J Pfaff Brewery Company, which was founded in 1857 by German immigrants, Henry and Jacob Pfaff, and its beer was made from the good, crisp tasting waters of the Stony Brook in Roxbury to produce not just beer, but the lighter lager. And with the large German population in Boston in the 1870s, the Pfaff Brewery was extremely popular. Originally located on Columbus Avenue, now the site of Roxbury Community College, their offices were in downtown Boston. And I assume that many of the men in the foreground were the Pfaffs themselves. But it says here, all things must come to an end. And after 18 hours of trial, Boston emerged from her baptism of fire. In that space of time, it had destroyed hundreds of the costliest and most substantial warehouses in the country. And this photograph shows the utter devastation wrought by the fire. Shells of buildings and walls pointed like fingers towards the heavens, served as grim reminders of the once urban streetscapes of Boston. And the granite blocks in the foreground would later be used to infill for Atlantic Avenue. And of course, the archway of ruins. And this depicts what was once the Boston Button Company at 67 Milk Street and was photographed by John Black, as well as sketched for Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper in 1872. It was said, quote, the archway of ruins on Milk Street is an artistic feat of the fire fiend who presents the appearance of some classical ruin of ancient Rome or Greece, Babylon, Thebes, or Tyre. And here, a photograph by James Wallace Black shows men standing on the rubble of Brewer and Tileston Company, which was owned by Thomas Brewer and James Tileston, or John Tileston, and located at 17 Milk Street. Brewer and Tileston were well-known printers and booksellers, and in the 1870s would annually print the Old Farmer's Almanac. The three granite piers of what remains of the building with massive granite blocks strewn in the foreground. And of course, a guard stands in front of the triached entrance to what was once McCullough, Williams, and Parker Company on Washington Street, with a sign stating that the company removed to 15 Tremont Street. A well-known wholesale and retail dealer of ready-made and custom clothing and men's furnishing goods, the store was one of the largest in the city, extending from Washington Street to Holly Street. And the facade of white marble uh, remarkably survived the fire, though the five-story business was completely destroyed, and that facade was reincorporated into the building rebuilt. And here, a horse-drawn wagon is seen near Congress Street. Lucius Baby said, quote, Baby, by the end of the week, the devastated section of the city showed signs of recovering order. And although smoke still curled from the numerous cellars and the protective agents were still engaged in tearing down tottering towers and chimneys, little shops, 
Baba saloons, bars, and chop houses was springing into being under canvas tents or in hastily erected sheds and pine board shelters. So at least people could get a haircut and something to drink and eat. And here, a milk wagon from the Consumers Protection Association on Hanover Street in the North End delivered milk and dairy products to those who were working in the Bird District. And there were hundreds of people working in the area, some living in wood shelters and members of the militia quartered in the Old South Meeting House. And this photograph is interesting, and it shows the delivery wagon driver holding the reins with a policeman to the right, men standing on the debris with Milk Street in the distance. Well, the site was a peculiar one, and the other devastation of the burnt district in the days after the fire was beyond comprehension. Standing on Washington Street, one could see to the waterfront, with whole blocks leveled by the fire. Smoke still rose from cellar holes where wood and combustible materials lay and smolder, creating an eerie and unearthly light as the dawn broke. And the history of the Great Conflagration states, quote, huge fields of glowing ruins covered with smoldering lambent fires, occasionally broken by piles of half-destroyed debris or standing walls, up which the blaze climbed and played, while overall hung a dense, murky pall of smoke, slowly floating to the southward and rolling heavy billows borne by the gentle breeze, unquote. And of course, seen here on Milk Street, scene of utter devastation with buildings destroyed, merchants would meet, discuss with soldiers the aspect of what they could salvage. Not much, but the whole aspect was seen here again. This was an area where you actually saw a portion of a building. And ironically, the glass is gone, but the window surround survive. Something when we realize a fire can destroy things completely, or it can be selective in its devastation. And here on Pearl Street, this wonderful flat iron building, which was triangular in shape, actually shows in the foreground the huge amount of debris that littered the streets of Boston, along with the dozens, if not hundreds of people in every single street. Well, in some ways, this was something that was said, and I call this a visitation intended to shock the minds of our citizens. This is a chapter that I was fascinated with. The reaction by ministers to the devastation wrought by the great fire was swift and condemning and was to be fought for sermons for the next few months. Frothingham stated, quote, people, instead of attending divine service, thronged to the streets immediately about the fire and churches were deserted, unquote. However, the following Sunday, ministers throughout Boston preached on the fire and its implications on life, greed, and loss. The Reverend Dr. Manning of the Old South Chapel preached, The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. The Reverend Dr. Webb of the Shama Congregational Church preached, Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? And the Reverend John Beckley of the Summer Street Baptist Church preached, Every man's work shall be manifest when the day shall declare it, for it shall be revealed by fire. However, it was the Reverend Cyrus Bartol of the West Church who preached the trial by fire, in which he delivered a sermon that was said to be, quote, a fine analysis of the influence of the great disaster upon the human mind, an acute essay on the harmony of nature above and beyond any local derangement of the elements, and was, withal, filled with sound, practical suggestions as to improve methods of city building and a severe invective against the spirit of lawlessness now pervading the country. The congregation, congregation should also be considered not merely as an accident which would, could be easily repaired, but as a visitation intended to shock the minds of our citizens into a due sense of the undue greed and haste which led to the building of mushroom blocks." Unquote. Well, seen here, Thomas Nast, the great political cartoonist, showed liberty, the personification of the United States, actually in abject grief, as it says, Boston, Massachusetts, the homestead of liberty. And we see a devil not only carrying a blazing torch, but ascending into the heavens 
after igniting the fire in Boston. We also began to realize that people like Russell Conwell, who I've quoted in this book quite often, and was the author of the history of the Great Boston, Great Fire of Boston, which recounted the impact of the fire on the city and was written, quote, to place before the present generation a readable and trustworthy account of the Great Fire in Boston. Conwell had attended Yale, and in 1862, he enlisted as a captain of Company F of the 46th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment in the Civil War. He studied law at the Albany Law School and was later ordained a Baptist minister. And he's best remembered as the founder and first president of Temple University in Philadelphia. And today, Conwell's name lives on at the Gordon Conwell Theological Cemetery in Andover, Massachusetts. Even Louisa May Alcott was quoted, and she said, quote, the fire was so great that it created a whirlwind and an awful roar. I saw blazing boards, great pieces of cloth, and rolls of paper flying in all directions, flying on roofs, spreading the fire. The granite blocks on Franklin Street went down like card houses, and heavy cornices peeled off as if of paper. Firemen could not go up their ladders. The heat was so intense, and many were killed by falling walls. And the red glare, the strange roar, and the flying people all made the night terrible. And I kept thinking of the last days of Pompeii. I enjoyed it immensely till two o'clock, and then we went home to get warm. And of course, even the Reverend Cyrus Bartol, who I mentioned was the minister of the West Church on Cambridge Street in Boston's West End. He was graduated from Bowdoin College and the Harvard Divinity School, and not only preached for 50 years, but was an author who would publish articles in various periodicals, including the Christian Examiner, the North American Review, and the Unitarian Review. In 1849, he published hymns for the sanctuary, also known as the West Boston Collection, and was well respected for his insightful writing. And the New York Tribune referred to Bartol as, quote, probably the most successful minister in Boston, unquote. But it was his sermon, which was published in 1872, that really did, in the name of the trial by fire, make people sit back and think. His sermon was both powerful and thought-provoking. And a quote from the moving sermon is as follows. Quote, for our calamity is our penalty, a fine we pay long ago predicted to our inflammable architecture by prophets of combustion, yet defied by greed of rapid gain, but coming to pass as naturally in the high tinder boxes, ranged close together out of reach of engines, as when you drill a hole and put in the charge and light the fuse or lay the train, the blast follows. Other people, including the governor of the Commonwealth, William Washburn, after the fire, he was instrumental in urging the legislature to be called into special session to enable the provision of state assistance for the rebuilding of Boston. Measures passed, including a bill simplifying the establishment of insurance companies, since several were bankrupted by the blaze, and a bill authorizing the city to issue bonds to speed the rebuilding effort which would encompass 65 acres of Boston. And the proclamation that he decreed in 1872 was one of public thanksgiving and praise. And it went into such detail that, of course, the fire was mentioned as well. Many people had been killed, 21. But the whole aspect was it could have been so much more. Well, seen here in a painting that was done just after the fire, we see that it's not only a great example of this conflagration seen again from the shores of East Boston towards the city, but it was something in some ways that chronicled one of the worst and most devastating fires in the aspect of the city. But there were also things that were really quite unique. And this was actually sheet music that was called Boston Fire Alarm Gallop. This was done by a man named George Rexford, and this is for the officers and members of the torrent engine number 18 of the Boston Fire Department. So you could have this played on the piano as you did your gallop or dancing on the court. 
But they also did things such as this, this broadside, which I just acquired a, a second copy. I still keep buying these things. It's called Homeless Tonight or Boston and Ashes. It was a song composed by Charles Albert White, which was published by White, Smith, and Perry of Boston. The cover of the sheet music was printed by J.H. Buffett's Sons in 1872 and depicts two terrified young girls clinging to one another as they escape from the burning city with the tower of Trinity Church on Summer Street in flames behind them. One poignant stanza of the song was, quote, who will pity us and who will give us shelter through this sad and lonely night, unquote. Well, the music was something that, again, you could have played on the piano at home. And this sheet music of Homeless Tonight was written, of course, in 1872 by Charles Wright, who was a well-known songwriter of the period. And the sheet music proved so popular that it ran through several editions. It was a piece for piano that could be played at home and thereby rekindled memories of the fire. White's lyrics created a sentimental and heartfelt pity for the two young orphans depicted on the sheet music cover. And the wordage is, quote, lone and weary through the streets we wander, for we have no place to lay our heads. Not a friend on earth is left to shelter us, for both our parents now are dead. Poor mother died when we were both young, yet father made a home. But now he's killed by falling timbers, and we are left here all alone. Sad. But Boston did spring. It's springing phoenix-like from the ashes, and the devastation of the fire was tremendous and was a shock not just to Bostonians, but to the readers of national newspapers. The New York Tribune and reporters had, and correspondents sending information for the Daily News as well as artists who sketched the ruins. The newspapers printed thousands of words of dispatches, including an hour-by-hour -hour recount of the progress of the blaze, a complete list of the destroyed properties, maps of the Boston Business District, the assets and Boston liabilities of scores of insurance companies, stories on the local angle of the calamity, and other features which many might imagine the devising only of recent high-pressure reporting. Day after day, news stories were printed, including that in the New York Times on November 13th of 1872 that boldly declared, quote, Boston alive again, unquote, and that, quote, businessmen too busy to mourn over their losses, unquote. Indeed, the regrouping and Yankee pluck was more than evident as businesses relocated and began anew. This was the site where the fire had begun on November 9th of 1872. By 1876, it was completely rebuilt. On the left-hand side is Church Green, the site of that wonderful octagonal church designed by Charles Bullfinch. And we began to realize that there was a new downtown area of Boston, banks, insurance, and department stores. And we would realize in some ways that Church Green is the junction of Bedford and Summer Streets and was rebuilt after the fire with five and six-story commercial buildings that created an impressive streetscape along with interesting signage in the 1870s. In this vein, the Reverend Cyrus Bartol said, quote, Boston admires Boston. She is worthy. The admiration she wins from those she bore not in her borders are far away. She gets up quickly from her fall rubs her robes, professes she is not hurt, makes noble light of and laughs at her hoist to the ground. She says she is no beggar and wants to refuse the alms like a prince she has bestowed. A grand temper, not unbecoming, but to be prized as one of the pillars of virtue. And here, this was the man that created the new Boston. George Clough, a very well-known architect, would become the first city architect for the city of Boston. And under his domain was the rebuilding of not just the burnt district, but every school, post office, police station, and of course, any municipal building being built in Boston from 1872 until 1878, when he retired. And of course, what he rebuilt was the city we might remember in our youth. This is Milk Street 
This is a photograph from 1876, so we realize it was built in less than three and a half years. The building in the center is the site of Benjamin Franklin's birthplace, and there's a small uh, plaque directly above with a bust of Franklin to declare it a historic site. But on the left, it has the Centennial Lunch Room, which was built for the Centennial of the United States, so we can date it to probably the fall of 1876. And of course, the United States Post Office and Sub-Treasury. This building was being constructed from 1872, but it was something that actually broke the fire. This was designed by Alfred Mullet in association with Gridley J. Fox Bryant and Alexander Esty, and was in the process of being built when the fire destroyed the surrounding area. It was the most impressive building built during the Victorian period and was in the Renaissance Revival and built of granite. On the tops of the two towers flanking the center roof were two 17-foot-high white marble statues by Daniel Chester French. On the left was labor, supporting domestic life and sustaining the fine arts, and on the right, science, which was controlling the forces of the newfangled electricity and steam. The central portion was ornamented with a heraldic figure which was appropriately an eagle with outspread wings grasping a shield with its talons. And the area in the foreground that we know as Post Office Square was all because of the devastation of the fire that opened it up and it became a grand area. Well, Washington Street, the area where the fire had begun, and if you look at the old South Meeting House, you might remember the buildings that were destroyed. In this photograph from probably circa 1900, these buildings themselves would include not just pool rooms, but Raymond's department store, Filene's department store, and a variety of other places with their signage. Well, Inferno, the Great Boston Fire of 1872, was a joy to write. I was fascinated with it. But in this way, I tried to quote many people that had discussed the fire and its impact on the city of Boston. It actually did lead to new laws and resolutions by not just the mayor, but the city council. No longer could wood frame mansard roofs be built in the city. No longer could there be fire plugs, but we had to have fire hydrants. And in that way, with similar couplings, because at one time different cities had different couplings, they actually standardized it so that water could actually simply be used. In that instance, the fire, though devastating and destroyed 65 acres of downtown Boston, it was also a great impact on creating the modern Boston of the 20th century. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Please. Anthony, uh, great reference, consistent reference to the, the marble blocks. The question arises, where did they come from? Marble was quarried in this country, primarily in Barry, Vermont. Now, Barry, Vermont was accessible because it could come down the Connecticut River and then from Springfield be brought by train to Boston. Many times in the 1840s and 1850s, marble that was used in sculpture or statuary came from Italy. But by the period of the 1860s, they had both marble, and most of us think of polished marble. This was limestone. This was unpolished marble. And it was something that was used in Boston. So they used brownstone, limestone. They did use polished marble and brick. So Boston was changing from basically what had once been a place of wood and red brick into a fairly modern city in the 1860s, built of what they thought was indestructible material. Did they not have quarry boats, so-called, coming down the coast? Well, they were quarry boats. They were, but there were quarry boats even in the period of the 1820s from Quincy. They would have a granite railway that led to East Milton Square, and then the granite would be placed on a quarry boat to bring it to Bunker Hill to build the Bunker Hill Monument. There were quarry boats that, yes, were used from Maine, but it was primarily the fact that this was brownstone from the area of the middle of Massachusetts and Barry, Vermont, granite and marble. Thank you. 
They do. They, did you um, know that the Beatty family uh, summered in Dallas? Yes, yes. Well, I belong to the St. Patolf Club in Boston's Back Bay, and it's in the BB Mansion. Okay. So it's quite a grand house. But um, this was James Madison BB, and it was his son who would actually write Lucius BB, many of the quotes that I use. His other son would eventually own the house in Back Bay and Highfield Hall in Falmouth. And a lot of times, many families, and they were extraordinarily wealthy. But many families were very generous to the public, and Highfield is something that's been preserved in a lot of ways, but also conservation land. So, uh, and they're still around today. Any other questions? Well, I do have books. They're $20 a piece, cash or check. But this is something in a lot of ways, I've only given you a touch. I probably bored you tremendously, but I've only given you a little bit of a touch of what I write in the book. Like I say, I had great fun writing this book, and I honestly think, because it was my 85th book, I had more fun with this than most other books, so uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. Thank you very much.